Welcome in from your SUV, from your tractor or your ute, or maybe you're even riding your electric motorbike. But from wherever you are, you're with Alistair Moorhead and Glenn Judson, and this is The Alan Juddy Show. Well, what we want to do is reach out and provide you some technical information on a range of agricultural topics which may interest you. But to do it in a different way. Casual and comfortable format that allows you to listen where you want and when you want. This is intended for general information, and for more specific advice, contact your local Agricom rep. Good to see you, Alistair. Looks like you've had your hair straightened, but oh, anyway. Thanks, Juddy. I'm pleased you noticed. We, um, what are we talking about today, Alistair? Uh, Glenn, we're going to be talking about uh, Dactalis glomerata, Coxfoot. Oh, Coxfoot. Yeah. Excellent. It's a, it's a much... Uh, Almost malign species, uh, but it's got a really important part in uh, our landscape, and it's going to be an interesting discussion because sometimes uh, something that is not perfect is actually still really important, and if you don't like it because it's not perfect, you miss the fact that it's actually still quite important. This is going to be really interesting, really interesting. Now, um, Cox, um, it's got another name? Uh, orchard grass. Wow. And especially uh, uh, to our North American uh, listeners, which would be uh, a more common name for it in North America. Well, just as a diversion, actually, Alistair, I was in uh, Orchard recently, actually with my daughter, and we stood there and we looked at the trees for an hour, and it turns out that wasn't the type of Apple Watch she was after. Oh, Glenn. I, I pity your daughters, by the way, with mm. jokes like that. So anyway. I hope people are still listening. So... <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, in terms of, so we're going to talk about Coxfoot, and I think you're right, it is a quite a misunderstood species. Um, in a lineup of grasses, let's say um, uh, there's, a, there's, there's, there's five or six grasses that are all lined up under lights and you've got to identify them, how would you describe a Coxfoot? How would you pick a Coxfoot out? What are the, what are the features of a Coxfoot that um, uh, disting distinguish it um, from other grasses? Yes, so, so I, I would go firstly, and I'm quite a layman and a very visual animal, so I would describe its colour first. And it's actually not an easy colour to describe because uh, for a lot of people, pastures are just green. Uh, but in this case, there's lots of shades of green and slightly different uh, uh, versions as well. And I Are there 50 shades of green oh, or is that something I, else? I guarantee you there's 50 shades of green and, uh, and I'm sure they're just as exciting as any other 50 shades of something. Anyway... With Coxfit, we are looking at a sort of like a blue, uh, a bluey green, uh, and it's a, it's, I don't know how else to describe it, but it's a, a, a bluey green colouring. I wonder, I wonder if, um, uh, you know, one of those um, paint companies have actually got a kind of <laughs> a bluey green called Coxfit. <laughs> Coxfit. I'm, I'm not sure, but anyway, oh, so it's bluey green. Yeah, and, and, and to be fair, there's about two other grasses with a very similar uh, Colouring. What are they? One is Timothy. Right. And the other is Phalaris. I'd like to think one or two people would uh, see Timothy in the New Zealand uh, uh, landscape a little bit every now and then. It's quite a small grass until it gets to Christmas time, and then it has a uh, quite a long seed head, almost like a cigarette. Um, but when it's in its pastoral state, it's, it's, it's quite a bluey green sort of colouring. Uh, Phalaris, we wouldn't see too much in New Zealand, but it's a, a, a significant base of the sheep uh, sheep sheep industry in Australia, and uh, again, it has got a very similar colouring. But Coxfit uh, is that same colour. Now, um, you can see this quite easily when you've got a mixture. It is, it is more obvious than I'm describing as a colouring source, but it has another major characteristic that is even easier once you see the bluish, greenish grass and then you want to go and look at it. It's got a, a very flat tiller. So most grasses are, are, are clumped and they're made up of a group of tillers. And these tillers create multiple leaves and they also obviously uh, can actually have a root structure coming off the bases on them. And you can pull these tillers apart and, and, and actually sow them out and they'll all become clones of the original plant. But this, these tillers, in the case of Coxfit are flat, and that's quite a distinct um, characteristic. And when the leaves emerge, they emerge flat, um, unlike Timothy, which is completely round. So those two actually characteristics, the the bluish green leaf and the flat tiller, 
are probably the ones that you would oh, distinguish Cockfoot look, there's with. There's lots and lots of other detail you could probably focus on, including the seed head, um, you know, other 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 examples. But from a general pastoral perspective, and keeping this at a really high level, that they would be the two take home. So the, um, visuals. So the seed head, um, just to describe to me um, uh, what that looks like, because it's because oh. there's a bit of a, um, a, a a clue in the name. Yeah, I don't get the clue either. Actually, I, I I've read about this as well, and that it's uh, developed its uh, name by its seed head, apparently looking like a rooster's foot, as in cock's, a cock's foot. foot. You don't. I can't see it. I don't get it. Anyway, it is a, a bunched seed head that, when it's out in full flower, it is um, it, you know you have your primary stem right up to the top, and when it's out in full flower, this bunched seed head forms uh, are is out on small petiole, um, petioles. No, they're not petioles. What are they? Uh, panicles, uh, quite rigid panicles, so it doesn't droop. It's still erect in this bunch habit on these little branches that come off the top and then the seeds are still clusters on these um, branches. On, and so really bad description to be quite frank, but it's also a fair description of, I don't quite understand how it became Cock's foot. Maybe, maybe yeah. we're dealing with sort of an inbred <laughs> cock. <laughs> we probably but, have. But let's move on from that. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, root structure, um, do you think if, if we looked at the roots, um, would they differ, differ too much compared to a ryegrass, for example? Oh, look, that's a really good question because probably it's underground where Coxfoot gets uh, most of its uh, its sort of reputation from. Uh, it's des- described as having a big, strong root structure and quite aggressive. Uh, as a species, it's really important to put in here right now. Uh, Coxford is a, a, a naturalised grass species of low, uh, medium to low fertility environments, uh, nice free draining soils. Actually, it's happy places in a, a, in a moderate rainfall, not a low, uh, probably around 800 mils on a free draining soil is its true happy place. In Australia, we have varieties and types of coxfits that will go down to 550 millimetres. And in, in Mediterranean environments, there's coxfits that are actually truly summer dormant and can probably cope with 450 to 550 mil rainfalls, and they go completely dormant in summer. But in general terms, coxfit is a grass of free draining soils and rainfall zones of between 650 and about 850 mil rainfalls. Um, and again, I would reiterate, in a medium to low fertility world. So this is its strengths. It is then therefore perceived to have these big root structures. However, if I would describe the root structure to the average person, I would actually say it's it's actually a very aggressive feeder from the soil of around the top 20 uh, centimetres. And, in that, and that's not a zone much greater than ryegrass, the top 20 centimetres. But uh, Coxfit dominates that top 20 centimetres very aggressively for both moisture and fertility. It has a, a proportion of its roots drop below 20 centimetres. That's a very uh, soil type dependent. But the other trait that makes Coxfit quite unique is it does develop these very solid and consistent crowns. And so when you get these clumps of Coxfit, um, the, the challenge I give most people was to actually take the time to pull one out one day um, because that really defines how much root structure is actually in, in true sense there. And nine times out of 10, you will be able to pull out a coxfoot plant. Now, if that was tall fescue with its deep dreadlock, lock, uh, dreadlocks, uh, root structures dropping well below 30 centimetres, really hard to pull a tall fescue out of the ground. But Coxfit, which has apparently got big root structures as well, is quite easy to pull out of the ground, which again highlights the majority of it as a, as a gross feeder in the top 20 centimetres. One of the other characteristics, and it really surprised me when when I was looking at a, a Coxfoot stand that was um, had quite a lot of cover on it, was the length of the leaves. They can get really long. Oh, really long. Uh, but I would also highlight that's highly variety orientated, and if we get into what What's changed in the New Zealand coxfoot breeding environment is that you tend to find, you know, particularly our business um, at Agricom, as our plant breeders have really valued very long leaves. Um, and so, if we, for example, um, harvested a single coxfoot plant for seed in January or February, and then left it all the way to June, some of the uh, some of the leaves will be about um, about one meter 
long, maybe 1.2 meters long, come right up to your middle or even your chest. Um, and so, yes, they continue to elongate quite dramatically when they're out by themselves and left for long periods of time. Yeah, no, that was a characteristic that really, um, really surprised me. So, um, so in terms of um, the the history of of the plant, um, in in terms of um, if we talked about uh, worldwide, you know, this was being um, exported out of the US, you know, in the 1700s. So it's as a as a pasture species, it's been around for a long time. Give us a flavour of what the the um, history has been um, in a New Zealand context. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, we'll probably have uh, guest speakers at a later date, which may be able to tease out this. Uh, in more detail because my knowledge base doesn't really go that far back in in, um, real terms. But uh, we do live in Canterbury and Banks Peninsula, uh, which is on the edge of Christchurch and the Canterbury Plains, has a a really incredible history of of Coxfoot seed production off the hills. And uh, it was uh, exported back to the UK in the very early 1920s and through that phase a lot of good detail in the museum at Littleton and, um, uh, sorry, Akaroa. And, you know, it played a big role in the development of the Banks Peninsula sort of agricultural community. Well worth following up the next time you're in Akaroa. Um, and so Coxfits played a role um, in that landscape, volcanic uh, hills, uh, relatively high rainfall, but nice summers and, and an ideal place to, you know, uh, harvest and, and export back to Europe. So that's one of the more distinct histories in the New Zealand environment. After that, uh, our government uh, body at the time, Ag Research, had bred uh, a couple of uh, modernish coxfits for their day in the late seventies, and um, and they were released commercially in the early eighties. Uh, the first of them being a variety called Wana, which had a quite a, a big history in the eighties. It was uh, actually a, a grass that promised a lot. Uh, because the landscape was very, very different then. We were heavily stocked. We had close to 62 million, 64 million, I think, uh, sheep at that time. Uh, the, um, there was subsidies associated with having large stock numbers, uh, particularly sheep at that point. Uh, the fertility of most of the New Zealand sheep industry was particularly low. The soil fertility, uh, uh, regularly phosphate levels uh, in Olsen P terms, uh, under um, under 15, quite regularly between 8 and 14. And Coxford, was very much the the perennial grass of the moment, but of course, uh, one of the problems with it being too successful was that it's uh, it's also not particularly. If you line up your five grasses and ask about where they all sit in the world of quality and animal performance, um, uh, you know, Coxfoot probably doesn't sit in the top three and probably not even number four, which probably makes Coxfoot sit around number five as far as your top five. And uh, and so the reality is uh, from an animal performance palatability perspective, you know, which we'll probably tease out. Yeah. So, so I guess it's a great uh, history. And I think um, one of the things that um, defines its history or, or was an important part of its history was some of the early sheep trials, which exactly that, Alistair, that showed that uh, this plant, um, while it was very good in terms of those low phosphates and uh, during those periods of dry, um, in terms of trying to finish lambs for oh, exact, uh, uh, was was wasn't particularly good. And and really, um, if you wanted to look at the reasons for that, is you've got a plant that has um, got quite a thick cell wall, and therefore, even in its uh, most um, vegetative state, it still has a high amount of the most indigestible parts of a, of a plant. So um, trying to get quality out of that was... Um, was Yeah, but in saying that, uh, it is worth teasing that out. Uh, it's still, a, it's still when everything's leafy, everything's moist, uh, it is below ryegrass. It's slightly below tall fescue. Um, about uh, and tall fescue and prairie grass, for example, would be very similar. Likewise, Timothy would sit between tall fescue and ryegrass. So my ranking for quality would be uh, ryegrass, Timothy, fescue, prairie grass, coxfoot, in that order. Um, and so it's not far away. It's just uniformly below them. Yeah. And, 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 and so it's not rubbish because when coxfoot is rubbish, the other grasses are rubbish as well. Yeah. So, so, so in, a, in a lineup, you know, it is it is one of the poorer quality uh, grasses, but not to say that actually at any one point it can be actually quite a high quality pasture. If anyone could sort of picture the whiteboard that we don't have that I'm now drawing on 
um, showing you a, like an S curve uh, from left to right, starting high, going down, and then leveling out as low. Uh, the key is a ryegrass is very, very high quality when it's managed well through the majority of the season. Extremely high quality. Uh, now, uh, coxit sits below the height that of quality that ryegrass gets, but has the same yep. S shame cape shape curve. And to be fair, they cross over in the middle. And interestingly enough, on average, coxfit doesn't quite get as low as ryegrass does as fast as ryegrass. So when everything's nice and moist and, and not too hot, ryegrass is exceptional. But as it gets hotter and hotter, uh, and probably the fertility regime starts to back off a little bit, uh, ryegrass crashes. And by the time it's a brown stubble in 32 degrees in the middle of summer, ryegrass is actually very poor quality. And for a window of time before Coxfit finally gets to the same place, it will hold quality at the bottom end, where if we're talking of megajoules and metabolizable energy, ryegrass might very well at its worst in the middle of summer in a dry environment get down to about 8.8 .8 ME. Uh, at the very same point of time, that Coxfit may be 9.2. Vice versa, Ryegrass might be at an ME of 12.4 for long periods of time, where the coxfoot may be at 12 or 11.8. Mm, you're right. And I think, interestingly, so if, if it's a quality um, forage that you're after, then you might go, well, um, ryegrass is probably the pick. But I guess the really interesting thing here is that um, coxfoot does suit some systems um, and bring some other things apart from that quality to, the, to those systems. Well, if we come back to your research... You know, let's discuss the research because actually what has caused uh, in New Zealand, what has caused Coxfit some harm has, as we came out of the Wana era of the 80s, particularly with this huge stock numbers, we were actually only producing car lamb carcass weights of about 12 kilograms as we came out of the 80s. And as our stock um, numbers started to decline and we started feeding animals better, you know, our, our ewe performance increased, our lamb lambing percentages increased in New Zealand, and we started to see um, a, a schedule arrive for higher lamb um, weights. Now, the, the, the key is, all the published papers of the 80s and the 90s were solely done on summer lamb finishing. Solely. Not the farm system. Yes. Just summer lamb finishing. So a reputation was very much formed that Coxfit was very poor for animal performance. However, this was solely done on lambs in summer not the, all the stock classes that we have in our landscape. And also in the day, our landscape was a little bit toxic with a lot of standard endophyte um, uh, ryegrass, which is uh, the endophyte which we've discussed in a previous podcast on what is an endophyte. Um, and the standard endophyte uh, is quite toxic through the summer months, particularly uh, has uh, uh, feeding um, alkaloids that impact feeding, alkaloids that impact uh, live weight gain. Now, Coxfit never had that. So in the really hot, dry environments where that was a big deal, it was a dilution factor in those pastures. But the pure Coxfit research for lambs highlighted that Coxfit was not good compared to other things. And that was being repeated over and over and over again, maybe with a bit of deer work at the start in the 90s as well, but predominantly with lambs in summertime. Yeah, and I think the, the really important part about that was that we just assumed at that point that if it wasn't great for growing lambs, lambs, that we almost ruled out all other stock classes. Correct. And it wasn't really until um, we started doing a little bit of work in terms of putting this in front of cattle and also recognising the importance of the legume with the uh, coxfoot that we really started to look at what benefits the whole system could bring. I think that's uh, that's uh, exactly where we want to be in this discussion is start to tease out so what's changed. But I can't emphasise enough, um, this is where compartmentalised research, looking at pure stands and the absence of how they fit on the whole farm for 12 months of the year and what are the farm's needs, um, uh, creates a big change that often takes the industry a long time to recover from. So the net result of virtually a decade of research telling people that Coxfit was bad for animal performance based on lambs in summertime was that for most of New Zealand, we took 
Coxford out of our perennial grass mixes through the 2000s. So it was a, a direct result of extensive research telling us Coxfit's not great for animals, only to remove the Coxfit from the general pasture mixes of most of our farm types, then to find that we're starting to feed our animals better, things are going well, live weight's improving, we've got novel and safe endophytes now on farm with ryegrass pastures, things are great, but suddenly tough conditions have brought persistence issues. And we've just taken the most persistent species out of our pasture mixes because in the 80s and the 90s, we were told it was really bad for animals. And now we're talking about persistence. And the other thing that occurred in New Zealand was as our sheep flock started to decline, our cattle herd started increasing. And of course, all the work was done on lambs. And now we're talking about a landscape which has got more and more cattle in it. And at the heart and soul of what Coxford is, it is actually a cattle grass. And this is where it has led on to exactly the discussion you were studying. And I think the other point, and and, and you've, you've made it a little bit earlier, was and breeding has changed what we see a Coxford is. Correct. And so with that breeding, um, from what I can see, we've got a, a plant which is probably much cleaner. And when I talk about cleaner, it's probably got less disease. But also, and I remember um, uh, closing some paddocks early at Marshdale, and we had both an old style and, and one of the new styles. And when and, we say and, old, we're talking about a naturalised pasture from 1970, 1970, and the Coxford would have been the same Coxford as what was sown in 1970. Yeah. So pre wana Yeah, pre wana and comparing that with the likes of Savvy, some of the new breeding. And, and I think the two things that stuck out from that exercise were, one, just how clean from disease uh, those modern types are. And the second one was the amount of seed head or the loading of seed head, um, even though we'd We'd shut that up. Was so much less in these in these modern coxfoot. So um, maybe some of the issues in and terms of be quality. Aware that is variety by variety. Not all breeding houses um, value that, but uh, in our business we have very low aftermath seeding, so that the seeding phase is very narrow and quite clean, basically. Yeah. And so what struck me was um, that that we could build up quite large amounts of cover standing uh, with this plant, but then it only took one grazing event to get that back into what was a, a normal rotation. Yeah. Um, so now we're starting to see, we, we, we've talked about quality here, but now we're starting to see some of the flexibility you've got, particularly in a cattle system, around the ways of shifting feed round. Well, for example, the other thing of the flaw with that is that if you use that very traditional um, uh, stored summer feed type scenario, you wouldn't want to put lambs on it. No. And you probably, just to put it in perspective, wouldn't want to put uh, high performance R1 cattle stock rising one year olds, you know. But but as a hay shed for R2s to get them from one period to another, or even um, for uh, high performance cows that that have drop body condition uh, um, at the end of um, weaning, um, it's a sort of feed that they would eat really successfully and do very very well on. Yeah, so so I guess this is this is um we're not saying this is necessarily um exactly the 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 best no. management of it, but no. it, what it gives you is oh, flexibility. It did a job. It did a really it did a fantastic yeah, job. So. And I think the other the other part of this, so we, we've got these um these cleaner cultivars that are the from modern breeding. Um, we have recognised the real benefit of of getting our legs into that. Now I just want to um. Uh, pull that apart a little bit more because we have gone through a phase where we've wondered which are the most appropriate legumes yeah. because in those very low um, rainfall zones, maybe our traditional white clover is not exactly the legume that we're after. And we have had some success with um, adding leucine into those mixes. So yeah. let's have a little talk about that 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 legume um, experience. Yeah, so... So first things first, you know, the, the lo average live weight we are seeing off our modern coxfits for cattle is actually really competitive with virtually all other grass species. And as you and when I say that, I really mean long term live weight. So you've been doing this work at our Marshdale beef unit and here in Canterbury for a number of years, highly measured animals and uh and I think a lot of listeners would be blown away to recognize, to understand that relative to high performance ryegrass or, or to a degree, 
although fescue and fescue clover has been our most successful live weight gain type, you know, uh, a, a pure stand of coxfoot with a legume base isn't as far behind as anyone would imagine when it comes to cattle. Particularly, and, I, and I'll just throw this in as a, as, a, as a really important observation here, is if you measure it, if, sorry, if you manage it like Coxford likes to be yeah, managed. Yeah, to a degree, yeah. If you're managing it like ryegrass, then um, maybe the ryegrass is better. But but there are some key things, we might come back to those, some key things about managing Coxford, which allows you to get the best out of it. But the key, the bigger result of some of that work was your question about um, legumes for different situations, both both the high rainfall zones that get summer dry, but also the true dryland environments that burn off in the spring. Uh, the, the, for the true dryland environments, where you start, you know, and, and to be to be honest, I'm a believer that uh, most of your pasture mixtures and that you're focusing on perenniality, but particularly in low fertility environments with moderate rainfall, I'm a big believer that you sow coxfoot with ryegrass because there's money to be made off ryegrass in the short term and as long as you put enough coxfoot in your perenniality and your longevity and your decision process around your pasture is made off the uh, the, the coxfoot when it um, goes through the second, third, fourth, fifth year and becomes a more coxfoot dominant stand. However, matching the legume to these things is, is the big deal. So in dryland environments, uh, there are four legumes that are the big four, to be fair, uh, in all terms, but they take on a bigger significance. I personally, you know, lucerne has a very defined place as a cropping plant, and we will discuss it at another time. And it's as a crop, it's undeniable. But as a perennial legume in a pasture, it actually still has a role with coxfoot to create that true perenniality. And uh, primarily the impact of how long will the coxfoot, uh, the lucerne last in a coxfoot pasture will depend on how long you rest it between grazings and with what stock class. So for sheep, set stocking for three months uh, with lucerne in your pasture, or uh, your coxfoot-based pasture, isn't ideal. Uh, set stocking for four weeks to six weeks, not a big drama in the world if you give it 40 days to recover or 45 days to recover. Uh, so lucerne as a taproot plant in a, in a um, low rainfall environment is an ideal partner for lucerne as it harvests a lot of moisture and nutrient from below coxfoot. Uh, the other species though that has a, has a really strong fit in a warmer uh, warmer climates, not the colder climates, but the warmer climates, is subterranean clover. And it's a great fit for coxfoot. Coxfoot tends to create space around it as it outcompetes other species. And that space is often not always uh, filled by weeds because coxfoot is very aggressive against everything. But the natural cycle of subterranean clover setting seed in a, in a spring before the onset of a hot, dry summer and then regenerating from seed where there's space and bare ground fits a a, 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 dare I say, it, a clumpy style of dry land coxfoot pasture. So subterranean clover has a great fit in warmer climates. Uh, then red clover, in a slightly more moist environment that is not as hot, red clover has a huge fit with coxfoot and, and is really complementary to particularly a cattle system uh, with uh, coxfoot. And then the, the fourth species and I never not put this in, is white clover. Because if you have a good year, white clover does really well and will also naturally reseed quite prolifically and actually almost turn into a pseudo annual type species if it gets a really successful reseeding. So it will keep regenerating over the years whenever you have a moist summer, cooler summer, and Coxfit's less aggressive uh, in those conditions. And white clover can actually be really relevant. Yeah, so I think the um, tr uh, traditionally we would have gone to um, the, the the reds and the whites and the subs, and I think the the message here is that we have actually got some really good results from using lucerne um, as the legume, particularly in these um, coxfoot pastures. Yeah, especially the deeper free draining. Yeah, and and I think um, whichever legume that we choose, the, my message is that the, we elevate the performance of both the plant and the animal off that by having um, addressing that legume content. If we can get a good legume content in there that sets us up for um, uh, you know, high quality material, uh, forage, and, but also um, healthy plants. And, and I suppose we shouldn't 
get off that subject without looking at the problem with Coxfit. And the problem with Coxfit is nearly always that it tends to be in light free draining soils of moderate to low fertility. If you're in high fertility environments um, and slightly better soil, you often will go to different grasses and different combinations. But in these lower fertility environments, uh, more summer dry environments, you tend to find your natural nitrogen reserves are quite low and therefore nitrogen cycling is one of the weaknesses associated with those uh, more Coxford orientated sands. It's very good at harvesting any nutrient that's in the soil and cycling it and actually producing a really large amount of dry matter from a moderate amount of uh, nitrogen availability. Uh, you put more nitrogen on Coxford, it just grows more. It's a really strong responder to available nitrogen. There was probably another bit that really surprised me when we started doing some of this work is we think of of um, Coxford as a as a plant for moderate fertility, but when we started applying even moderate amounts of nitrogen to that plant, the response that we got out of it from a dry matter production point of view was is outstanding. The plant science team at Lincoln University have done some great work on that, including um, work that relates to water use efficiency associated with nitrogen content. And of course, that's one of these keys. If if a plant has a good nitrogen status, it's much more efficient all around, including efficiency in the use of moisture. And there's some really, really good work um, on that topic out of that university. And uh, it makes a real difference to both its palatability, live weight gain expectations, but also just sheer volume and therefore what you can do with that feed in your farm system. So in our um, systems experiments, um, we were typically getting a very similar production per hectare off um, some of these stands, not necessarily because we were growing animals a whole lot faster, but when we started managing Coxfoot on a slightly longer round, you know, building up larger pre-grazing covers, what we were actually finding is that the carrying capacity of those stands was slightly higher, which basically offset any um, small decreases that we might have had in per animal per production. So, so, but the trick there was managing it in, a, in that slightly longer round and 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 not going in at three ton and maybe more going in at four ton, for example. Correct, correct. And and I think there comes this uh, synergy that once you systemize. Uh, Coxfit for a cattle system, which is what you're describing. It's really important to acknowledge that because there's a lot of sheep farmers that, you know, Coxfit is a really important species for perenniality in their landscapes. And, and again, they're more consistently um, grazing. They often more intensely grazing than cattle uh, and more selective. So they're targeting the other species that are more palatable than Coxfit. They all create their own problems. But with cattle, uh, you know, the volume that we can convert uh is just it fits a cattle system so strongly. But most importantly, the rotation length that creates the volume fits red clover and lucerne magnificently. And to a lesser degree, but no less important, chicory. Yeah. So if we then just come back to a farm, because I think I'm, I want to just tease that out a little bit more in terms of our farm systems, the farm systems that we'd put Coxford in and the way that we might manage those, because I think that's really important. You've made a really important point that uh, my my head's in with uh, cattle grazing in terms of those big covers, but but um, this is um, a, a, a base for well, sheep production well, Jody, as well. You, you take me through. You, you call so, the so, system so, and I'll, I'll, I'll so, tell you the role of Coxford in right, the system. So, so let's, let's, um, let's start with uh, um, our dear old sheep farmers. Yes. Um, so... As a, um, if we were explaining, and let's now use the modern genetics in terms of things like savvy, um, uh, where would you see savvy placed in a, a sheep system? Well, a, a breeding, let's say, a breeding finishing sheep system. Okay, so here we go. This is this is the thing about asking the right questions, and you've just asked me a question, uh, but we haven't teased out a couple of those uh, things. So we don't need to understand what is the role of perennial pastures and what are your expectations of perennial rota- um, pastures? What's your farm rotation length and what are you expecting to be able to get around your farm and renew those pastures? Now, if you're a, 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 in a fertile environment, you may have really valuable land and it's going to be quite a lot smaller than some of our bigger sheep and beef operations. Um, you know, Coxfoot, probably actually doesn't play as big a role, to be quite honest with you. Uh, But as soon as perenniality for the economics of repasturing becomes an elevated discussion, uh, Coxford is an incredibly important part of it. So in, in all intents and purposes, you've got two distinct environments. You've got just the warmer dry land or colder 
um, central New Zealand uh, dryland environments, and Coxford does play a very strong role in that world, uh, and it's solely from perenniality. If you could get ryegrass to last, you would, but the reality is if ryegrass dies, it's so much better having Coxford there than the other weed grasses that come in behind them. For the free draining, medium fertility uh, environment that has a bit more summer moisture, up to say, for example, 800 mils, uh, which is a big chunk of the New Zealand landscape. Uh, the desire to have Coxford as part of your pasture mix is is there because you, you can do better with ryegrass, but that whole zone is really um, significantly infested with brown top. And so although ryegrass is your ideal species, before you get to your end of a 10, maybe 12 year rotation on a sheep and beef farm and that sort of 800 to 1000 mil rainfall, moderate fertility landscape, um, you will be having regenerated brown top into that landscape. Now, finishing the last part of that rotation as a Coxfit stand fits that type of farm business really well. Make money up for eyegrass for four, five, maybe six years, but finish with Coxfit, which gives you your longevity for as long as you actually want to use it for before it, you have too much of it or it becomes something. It fits so well because you have cattle. You have cattle inside your system and they're roaming and they will be grazing those stands more often than not or prepping them for other stock classes. You have capital use, use, large flocks of ewes. Now, they're not prime lambs. Their job is to be held. Their job is to be um, fed well under periods of stress. Uh, and actually, Coxfit can do that. It can feed them surprisingly well and much better than brown top for the big chunks of that time. So in the sheep and beef scenario, that is exactly where Coxfit would play its role. Really important in the dryland environments, be them cold or warm. Um, important for the mid rainfall zones with moderate fertility because brown top is our, our invasion pest weed uh, grass and you're better off having Coxfit every day. Yeah, I think um, probably the word that would describe what you've just said is resilience. Yeah. Um, where you've got the ability for things to go brown, um, uh, having Coxfit in your mix is always going to be useful because we know that it is um, a very much a a uh, persistent plant yeah. under under some of those. So I like that. So so for both sheep and beef, and and, and uh, we've got it as that um, that base in terms of having something that's going to be there um, when maybe ryegrass is coming under a little bit of pressure. Do you think there's a role for it in dairy? Uh, yes, I do. So we just got to always remember we're we're in a very diverse dairy landscape today. You know, we've got uh, natural rainfall environments throughout the country. And if you look at the south of New Zealand, those natural rainfall uh, uh, come with lower temperatures, traditionally, not not in the summer of 2022, 2021, uh, 22. It's quite hot down in Southland. But in general terms, uh, uh, it, it's natural rainfall, cooler temperatures, and natural ryegrass world. But they're asking different questions of themselves down there now too. And they, you know, if they start to get drier and they start to get warmer, um, how do you keep a grass cover in an environment where um, you may find your summer dry period goes from being just two weeks or four weeks to six to eight weeks in that sort of landscape? And Coxfit can actually be quite a sustainable, high-performance species through that time. Also, it can be used as a carried feed into the wintering phase in that uh, southern landscape. If you come into dairy under irrigation, the answer to that is actually it is much a secondary species to ryegrass. The ryegrass's quality and ability to grow pretty much in, in irrigated soils is, is pretty amazing. And it's not until you get temperatures in the 30s um, that you would ever consider another species. And you are likely in an irrigated dairy to consider fescue before Coxfoot. However, in an irrigated dryland dairy, uh, irrigated dairy in a dry environment, you sometimes find the outside of pivots, uh, also pods or, or um, post irrigation. You might find there's big areas of inefficient irrigation or no irrigation on the outsides of pivots. Now, in that landscape, a ryegrass coxfoot mix would work extremely well and make a functional use of not insignificant amounts of land on the outskirts of those irrigation areas. And those small areas of coxfoot do not impact the vat. 
They don't crash quality of the total sward or the total intake across the whole paddock. Uh, and in fact, you might find at certain times of the year, cows actively go seeking it to get the balance of fiber and, uh, and quality, um, the style of fiber that particularly fiber that the um, vegetative coxfoot plant may provide. For example, in the early spring period when ryegrass's quality is quite off the chart, coxfoot would create a really strong balance in their diet to that. Yeah, that's um, and, and I think that's exactly right in terms of there is a role, um, but actually identifying um, in a dairy system exactly where that um, fits. It's not, it's not a, um, I don't think it's going to replace ryegrass, for example, but it does have a quite a good fit. Uh, and it um, certainly does fit in uh, dry land dairy, but in hotter environments like the northern part of New Zealand, it does fit there. There's other things that come to play. Now, um, uh, a, uh, a farm system that's um, dear to my mind, uh, dear. <laughs> uh-huh. um, uh, do we see a role for Coxfoot in, in a deer system? Uh, look, uh, straight up, not really. Uh, but but the deer system is made up of stags, hinds, and wieners. Uh, but you can't ignore the fact that in in the um, the hind, you know, the the biggest scope of the breeding farms, um, hinds can be integrated with cattle and are also on hillsides and hill country. Uh, now, broadcast. Coxfit into those landscapes does improve feed supply and feed um, uh, cycles. And there's no doubt that using Coxfit in sort of, for example, the broad acre environments that hinds can be found in, on particularly on hills, is really valid because you have quite significant cattle systems that integrate with them. On the flats, far less so. They are quite a selective animal and Coxfit's right at the bottom of their their preference. Yeah, I think one of the key things, I think was well, you've mentioned two things which I re- think are really key. One is integration of cattle, so you can clean that up. And I think you're or absolutely- just, just for cattle farming, full stop. Yep. You know, you've got cows in your system. Yeah, and so on the hill, and you can imagine um, coming into that fawning period, if you've got um, something that can hold um, relatively large covers up there, um, great place for uh, hinds to hide fawns, but the ability to clean it up with Cattle at a later stage as I part think, of your farm business, as part of your so farm business, doing multiple jobs. Yeah, in the I same think landscape. that's 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 really view, particularly where you've got hill country which is not summer safe, correct? Um, and and of that lower fertility, I think it's got a real um a, a real niche there in terms of. So so I'll just summarise very quickly. Actually, no for coxfit with deer, but it doesn't mean to say it's no in deer environments if you've got a large cattle policy. Yes, because you've got to feed both, not just. That's right, and and I think the the ability um, to create fawn and cover, yeah. I think, is also a really a, a very useful part of um, part of that. Do you think? Um, uh, and we've covered a little bit of this, but um, what do you reckon the major pests of Coxford are? Oh, uh, do they have any? Oh, glyphosate is a pretty uh, a significant pest of uh, Coxford. Uh, every now and then, a person actually gets sick of just how um, clumpy the world of Coxford can be. Are people? We didn't touch on this earlier, really important. A lot of people believe modern coxfits don't clump. That is not correct. All coxfits clump when they're given space and uh, and grow by themselves. They form a crown, and that crown is really significant and can form a clump. It can form different size clumps based on the genetics, but if it doesn't form a clump, it's not coxfit because that's actually one of its true um, defense mechanisms, and we're going to discuss this with the actual pests. But quite regularly, uh, if people work with, particularly on flat paddocks, work with Coxford on a more lax system, it can get very clumpy. And as you drive, particularly motorbikes, uh, but also rattly old trucks uh, across those sort of paddocks, uh, it doesn't take much for a few individuals to get sick of it and then pull the trigger on, on glyphosate as probably one of its bigger, bigger ways of taking Coxford out of the landscape. As far as pests go, um, probably starting at the north of New Zealand, it does not have a natural end of fight. So it relies on a, a, a genuinely coarse root structure and a crown. That crown, which is the clump, is actually a por- important mechanism for plant survival. Now, as in the north, um, the single biggest pasture pest for it is actually um, African black beetle. And it has a, a it's a scare, a, 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 quite an aggressive, significant scarab that has a very large and quite aggressive larvae underground. And now this will chisel out uh, coxfoot completely out of 
take it right out. Uh, the key to the coxford is that it will regularly get pulled out of the ground and particularly light free draining soil because it'll have nothing holding it in the ground. They'll chisel out the base of the clump as well. Uh, the, the difference though with coxford for most other species, that will be the end of all other species. They'll just disintegrate, the crowns will separate and they'll just literally die. But with coxford, because of this clump, it actually has the ability, even if the whole plant is brown, that when moist conditions occur in autumn, and if the growing conditions are well, that crown will actually activate from uh, dormant nodes, particularly around those throughout the clump, and it will actually reroot itself to the ground. And as long as it's not pulled out on the next grazing round, and if you could roll it, it would even be better, um, that plant will reestablish itself. And within six to eight months, you wouldn't even know it had been pulled out. So I would never say it's, toler um, it's only tolerant and in the north it's not. Now you come down into the uh, other parts of the country, the other big pasture pest is uh, New Zealand native grass scrub, much smaller version of African black beetle, but actually its populations are so large it's decim it can decimate it. So coxfit is one of the last species to be taken out. It's only tolerant. It will eventually be chiseled out just like I described with black beetle. Black beetle do it much more successfully with a smaller number of larvae. Um, uh, grass scrub actually needs lots and lots of larvae to pull out a coxfoot plant. And uh, the same scenario can occur. It can re-establish itself. It can re-root it back into the ground from this really strong, stable crown if it's in contact with the soil. Um, Argentine stem weevil in New Zealand is, is a pasture pest that it can impact uh, coxfoot, but I would suggest mostly as a seedling, not so much as a, an established plant. It's actually a little bit too big, and those crowns are a little bit too are fully established to allow stem weevil to wipe it out as an adult, fully established coxfoot plant. But for the first six to eight months, coxfoot can be vulnerable because it's only often got two or three, four tillers at it during the establishment phase. Because it is one of the more uh, slow to establish species. Correct. And uh, the last um, New Zealand pest of really big significance in New Zealand's Pariner. And the key is just like it's not a perfect species for animals from a quality, it's not a perfect species for Pariner either. And they don't like it, relatively speaking. So they again will eat out everything else around it. Um, and Coxa will be very much the last on their menu. The um in, in terms of just tell me about um the ability to stand up to pugging and wet soils is that a is that a challenge for Coxford? Well, mainly because you mentioned wet soils and it's a plant of free draining conditions. So we'll put Coxford in many landscapes for many roles. Uh, once you start thinking about it, some people will be attracted to the fact it's got this crown. It's pretty resilient, uh, and we'll put it in a number of different environments because of that. Now, there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a big world of you know, grass wintering that we're slowly um, grappling with in New Zealand to understand it better. Coxford has a big role to play in that. Um, it's mainly because it can create large amounts of cover in, from deferred feed from late summer through into winter. And in that state, it's pretty resilient because it keeps the hooves of animals above the ground. Uh, however, because it's spatial and it, often in its as it gets older, it is still quite clumped, you know, Cattle can still damage between the crowns and it doesn't like wet feet and it doesn't like those situations a lot. And what you'll tend to find is the soil structure will still be damaged between the crowns and because it's not a, a sod forming plant. It's like I say, a crown forming plant. And so it can be damaged during those phases. Right. I listened. I've really enjoyed this uh, chat about, um, about Coxfoot. Um, I'm actually off to uh, straighten my hair, so I look like you. Um, <laughs> oh, look, uh, well, before you go, uh, Glenn, and uh, work on your hairdo, um, we should just summarise uh, Coxford. It's had a long history, and uh, to be fair, it, it, it's taken, it, it's been a little bit maligned by a decade's worth of research on one stock class in the absence of its place in the greater farming system. And I feel... It's important to acknowledge that that literally all research done on Coxfit through the 80s and 90s were focused on lamb live weight gains. We have many wonderful species for lamb live weight gain and um, using Coxfit as part of those research programs have highlighted that it's not all about quality, uh, and but it's ignored. Coxfit really is a major solution for the persistence element of our pastures and our landscape um, and our rotations. So. In summary, you know, it's not a species for outright live weight gain in summer. 
It fits, though, in an environment that's moving more towards a cattle policy. fits very strongly. It is also a species that can compete with brown top, and therefore, if your environment means that your pasture persistence moves from your productive species to brown top, you should consider putting coxfit in your mixes because uh, when you finish with coxfit, not brown top, at least you have a productive plant that gives you options. Uh, we've discussed legumes because nitrogen and protein are a major part of keeping it both productive but also palatable and provide an element of performance. And those uh, legumes that fit most with coxfit based pastures are uh, lucerne, red clover, and subterranean clover in the warmer, drier environments. I always put white clover in because what happens if you get rain? It's a magnificent species and can reseed. Uh, our, um, chicory also fits very well with the coxfoot based pasture. And I think I did summarize it in more than one moment through the, the podcast is that personally, you can sow these grass pastures predominantly with coxfoot and the species I've just described. But I also personally recommend considering it, making an element of your perennial ryegrass selection based on your landscape choices, recognizing that. Uh, you could transition from making money out of ryegrass for a period of time, but your persistent element of your pasture is it transitioning to a coxfoot based pasture at the very end. So that would be some of my take-home messages, Glenn. You can go and find a mirror and sort that hairdo out. Great summary, Alistair. Catch you later.